Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening from the regions you are joining in. Thanks for joining our webinar on this very topical subject. So I am your host. My name is Ruturaj Patil. I'm working as a product manager for the liquid products line with a global animal nutrition company, AW Nutrition. Presently, I am based in Germany. So today we have a guest speaker, Dr. Chris Mauro with us. Chris has invented the live mycoplasma Sinovi vaccine, MSH, from a field strain. He is a reviewer for over half a dozen international veterinary journals. And presently, he is working as an honorary associate professor in the Faculty of Veterinary Science of the University of Melbourne. He is also heading the avian team of the International Organization of Mycoplasmology. His current interest is intensive poultry production with minimal use of antibiotics by total mycoplasma control. So we will present the pre-recorded presentation from Chris in 40 minutes. And then I will follow with a presentation for a relevant solution for the respiratory problems in the poultry from EW Nutrition, which will take 10 minutes. So once again, thanks for being here. And now let's start. Today, uh, we're going to look at mycoplasma infection in poultry, especially in respiratory disease. I'm Chris Morrow, and I'm a um, veterinarian, and I also um, have been very involved in mycoplasma over the years. I developed the MSH um, vaccine back in 1988, and I'm now uh, involved in the marketing and technical support of live mycoplasma vaccines that we make in Australia. Outline of the talk. First, we're gonna talk about what are mycoplasma. Then we're going to talk about the impact avian mycoplasma has in broiler breeders and in broilers. A little bit on the impact of avian mycoplasma in uh, layer industries. And we're going to concentrate a lot on the respiratory disease and the involvement of mycoplasma in respiratory disease. So mycoplasma are um, ultimate parasites of, uh, of animals. Um, here is a tissue culture cell. And what's happened here is it's showing the mycoplasma uh, living on the surface that have attached to the uh, tissue culture cell here. Um, so traditionally, we've thought of them as um, surface, uh, living on the surface, mucosal surfaces. And um, but recently, um, some intracellular uh, forms have been um, identified. And these uh, intracellular forms may be involved in um, helping mycoplasma survive the host response or even antibiotic treatment there. So they tend to do um, be very host associated. Once they're away from the host, um, they die rapidly, um, desiccation. They have no cell wall, very little protection um, uh, there. And they're minimalist organisms. They evolve from um, uh, Clostridia and um, uh, similar organisms uh, by losing their cell wall and um, and in this way, they also uh, don't survive outside the host very well at all. In the laboratory, uh, we can see them, we can grow them on agar, and here it's two different species growing on agar. Some have more prominent nipple than, um, than others, um, but really uh, this doesn't help us identify them to species level, but it can help us identify uh, mycoplasma. The nipple itself is this central zone here that grows into the agar and you can see it um, on the surface of the agar. These colonies may be, I don't know, one millimetre to five millimetres across um, and they're made up of individual cells with no cell wall that are very pleomorphic um, so they can wiggle through um, filters, they can um, uh, but generally shaped like a balloon, although some species, some of the more pathogenic species, have more um, uh, have anatomical features like a flask, and we'll see that a little bit later on. 
Certainly, antibiotics that work against cell wall synthesis don't affect mycoplasmas at all because they don't make a cell wall. Um, so amoxicillin, cephalosporins, and a lot of other types of um, antibiotics uh, don't do anything at all to mycoplasmas. To grow them, because of this minimalist uh, genome, very small genome, they've, um, they've ditched a lot of the abilities to um, manufacture um, uh, certain um, uh, f things like uh, you know, um, proteins and so on where they can, and they absorb them from the environment or the host um, around them. And they'll even use um, proteins that they can find around um, as just like bricks rather than proteins and um, functional proteins and use them for structure. So this happens um, in uh, growing in the laboratory. So they'll absorb um, proteins from the serum. There's 10% serum usually in these um, uh, in mycoplasma media, 10 to 20%. It'll absorb it into the surface of the growing mycoplasma rather than synthesizing them, saving some uh, metabolism and so on. Uh, but this means that when the host gets to see these, or sometimes um, when they look at um, uh, using these organisms for antigens in ELISAs or other types of systems, RSAs and so on, that uh, you can get some cross-reacting um, uh, antibodies that are not specific for mycoplasmas, but giving you um, uh, false positives in these. Uh, typically, um, the exposure of the of the chicken to the serum might have been in the um, killed vaccine. So on the um, uh, agar, um, they look like fried eggs. And so this is fried egg morphology. Mycoplasmas are extremely small here. Um, they're the smallest um, self-replicating organisms. Here's a picture of uh, Mycoplasma genitalium, a, um, a human mycoplasma, compared to other things like Haemophilus, Staphylococci, and finally up to red blood cells here. They're very, fairly amorphous and here we can see balloon-like uh, features, very um, no nuclei and so on in there. This is very small. Uh, some of the interesting features of mycoplasma is that um, they have airborne transmission, whether it's at a, as an aerosol or on dust or whatever, it's um, not being looked at very much. But this means that um, being in proximity to infected animals, your farm can become um, infected. And I've seen MS, for example, go over two kilometres um, on the wind. So these uh, ultimate um, parasites, they have a lot of different mechanisms for survival in chickens. And in chickens, they do a, a chronic active infection. It's not a latent infection with the uh, mycoplasma hiding away in some protected site. Um, they just infect and ones like MS actually infect and have high populations for the life of the bird after infection. MG populations can be remain fairly low initially, but then um, can become active, especially the vaccines um, as they uh, come into lay. There's other methods too, biofilms. These are colonies of, um, of organisms in the animal, and these are thought to um, offer protection um, uh, to the mycoplasma by um, uh, being as a colony and stopping um, uh, certain host attacks or antibiotics from getting to the centre of the colony. Um, we talked about the intracellular phase and the way that this would protect against um, antibodies and um, and in fact, the way we identified it was using gentamicin, which doesn't go into cells, and uh, mycoplasma survived in this situation. Um, 
also antigen uh, switching of surface molecules means the host immune um, response is often chasing and um, and uh, being activated all the time uh, consuming nutrition and um, and uh, host resources uh, trying to keep this active chronic infection under control we talked about absorption of proteins into the surf surface and the way that this allows the organism um, to um, be metabolically uh, very lean um, using um, uh, uh, proteins that are around to do this. Um, there, not many toxins have been identified, especially in avian um, mycoplasmas, but peroxide generation um, it is thought to uh, happen, and uh, this may be involved in the um, shearing of um, cilia from the mucosal surface in the respiratory tract. A lot of the pathology is actually from the host response, and um, and we shouldn't always think that the host response um, is good for the host. It may be making things worse in these cases. For example. The antibodies in a infected um, egg may stop the egg from embryo from dying from the mycoplasma infection and actually increase vertical transmission in this situation. So the problems we see with um, mycoplasmas are biological diseases, diseases of the respiratory, the reproductive tract and uh, sometimes systemic manifestations like infectious synovitis. Then chronic uh, production inefficiencies associated with this chronic infection um, are a big problem. Um, and sometimes these problems are a lot bigger than just the, um, um, the problems experienced um, as diseases, uh, the production inefficiencies. So in broilers, this is, takes its form well. Antibiotic dependence, um, you know, the need to give antibiotics, say, 18 days to stop vaccine um, reaction to Lesotho vaccination at day 10 um, is, a, is a very common one that um, many places of the world have to do. And also um, there is uh, effects on the FCR, the uh, changing of feed into um, uh, tissue. In layers and breeders, um, egg output is affected. Um, uh, it also antibiotic dependence, the antibiotic strategy uh, can be, um, uh, is driven by um, controlling the mycoplasma infection. Uh, whether people realise it or not, actually. And finally, we've started to identify that there is um, an effect on the efficiency of conversion of feed into eggs. And if we try to quantify these uh, pathogen costs, uh, we can look at Mycoplasma galoseptikum. Uh, studies done in the 1970s and 80s showed that um, uninfected flocks um, laid 10 to 20 extra eggs per year, um, even if it was sub Flocks that were um, uninfected and became infected in lay could have an egg production drop, maybe up to 50% of the production could disappear, um, peaking after two weeks and then returning over the next two weeks. There was uh, decreases in hatchability, and this is associated with late embryo mortality and we could see air sacculitis in pipped embryos at this stage. And also, um, uh, if we took MG into the laboratory, we could produce primary respiratory disease by just mixing MG and the SPF chicken. Uh, but also, we could produce chronic respiratory disease. And this was associated um, uh, with... Uh, um, mortality and poor FCR and the progeny, and we could even lose as much as 40 points of FCR. There is also probably an effect on uh, the efficiency of turning feed into eggs, and this could be as high as 12%. This has been seen in birds that were infected and treated with tylosin continuously 
their efficiency of egg production was 12% better than uh, birds not receiving tylosin. Um, Mycoplasma synovi and the effects you see with this infection are fairly strain dependent. Anything that MG can do, Mycoplasma synovi can do as well. Layers uh, produce uh, between um, five to ten eggs per year less in infected flocks than uninfected flocks and um, this is even without any clinical signs being seen in the flock. There are some strains, uh, we had them in Australia, that can cause egg production drops uh, in lay if an uninfected flock gets infected. And again, uh, we can see decreased hatchability with air sacculitis in the pips. Um, increased broiler condemnations. Uh, this is um, purulent material in the um, air sacs and uh, bones of uh, birds. Uh, with MS at the slaughterhouse um, has been recorded and also um, respiratory disease but unlike um, Mycoplasma galliseptacum, Mycoplasma synovi usually just mixing it with um, uh, with an SPF chicken you don't see any disease but if you put other things in like respiratory viruses or respiratory vaccines in the laboratory we can produce disease. Um, so because sometimes people think it's not a primary pathogen, then um, uh, they think that MS causes nothing. But as we've looked at intensive um, uh, broiler production uh, more closely, we see a lot of things that in the laboratory cannot uh, do not cause problems when just mixed uh, in an uncomplicated way with the um, with the with the SPF chicken uh, like TRT or um, uh, some of the low path avian influenzas but in the field they can cause very big problems uh, when we mix them together uh, there's a um, there's also a suggestion that peritonitis, E. coli peritonitis at the beginning of lay is triggered by MS infection, especially in Europe and other places where we can rear birds free of MS, layer birds free of MS, and they don't get challenged until they go to the um, uh, to the layer layer farm. Infectious synovitis is very strain um, associated and um, so it's usually confined to geographical areas like um, uh, we had it in Australia but it's disappeared now we've had it in um, uh, USA of course but we've had it in um, South Africa and we controlled that with vaccination but in yellow chicken and so on in China Taiwan Vietnam uh, it's a big problem in these ones because they have the strains that cause synovitis in there. Glass top eggs appeared in about the year 2000 in um, the Netherlands and Germany and then it spread around the world uh, and can be a, a big problem. Um, but also there is a, um, a suggestion that increased second quality eggs um, is associated with being MS positive. Uh, but this may be uh, because uh, MS positive uh, chickens uh, 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 often haven't had antibiotics to suppress the um, serological response and maybe other things are causing the problems, uh, the second quality eggs like uh, Brachyspira infection. FCR in egg production, uh, we have estimates to show that um, vaccinated flocks uh, have improved FCR up to between 4 and 12% better than um, unvaccinated flocks where challenges um, has occurred and also there'd be FCR advantages in meat production as well. But I think the biggest thing that um, Mycoplasma has done is it's made our poultry, intensive poultry industries in some parts of the world where they haven't can't control the infection, it's made them very antibiotic dependent. And in fact, programs like antibiotics um, one week a month uh, um, in layers and, um, and strategically at 18 to 20 days in um, broilers are um, 
uh, signs of a response to mycoplasma infection. If we try to understand a little bit about what happens in the chicken, the um, bird's uh, breathing system is uh, very different to mammals. The lungs do not change size, uh, but the air sacs um, uh, do enlarge and, um, and reduce as the birds uh, breathe in and out. And uh, the air sacs are part of the respiratory tract, and sometimes we see the manifestations of mycoplasmas. Uh, in these places. Um, the normal trachea uh, has a very thin mucosal uh, layer up here and this is uh, lined with ciliated epithelium, goblet cells and not that many other cells in this in this area. When you have mycoplasma infection and this is mycoplasma galliceptacum, the um, Mycoplasma galliceptacum is here, the cilia is here, and this is mucosal cell over here. And they try to attach to the tracheal mucosa, orientating themselves in this direction here. This causes a loss of cilia. It interrupts the uh, efficacy of the mucociliary escalator and uh, uh, mucus, parallel, mucoparalent uh, buildups are quite common. Uh, in fact, um, this is uh, experimental infection I did during my PhD, and it shows mixing MS and uh, field strain of IB together. I was able to cause air sacculitis in these um, in these birds uh, uh, here. But in the field, um, you do a post mortem and you see this. You cannot tell whether it's MG or MS. You need to do further laboratory testing. Air sacculitis is a thickening and a clouding of the um, the uh, air sacs, and here you can see the injected uh, blood cells, and um, and you can see the um, exudation on the surface of the of the um, of the uh, air sac. Uh, it's important not to get confused by um, uh, he, here, not to get confused by um, uh, fat that may be, especially in broiler air sacs. And if you want to tell the difference, and or in pipped embryos, push the material with a, a blade, and if it doesn't move, it's fat, and if it moves, it's um, exudate. Here in um, uh, pipped embryos, uh, these birds do not managed to break out of the shell before the, um, the uh, hatchery um, terminates the hatching process. And so they're still alive inside often, uh, moving around, but they're too weak to get out. And what happens is that, the, um, uh, is that when they go to use their respiratory tract, when they first start to have to use it after pipping at 18 days, all of a sudden they are um, have a problem with um, uh, getting enough oxygen into the blood and this makes them weak uh, to get out. Here we can see with um, mycoplasma infection that there is a massive infiltration here of the, um, of the, of the uh, tracheal mucosa. There's exudation into the lumen here. This infiltration is um, uh, a mixed infiltrate, uh, mononuclear cells and um, and also uh, uh, neutrophils, uh, uh, polynuclear cells as well. After a while, it sometimes organises itself into a, um, uh, follicles um, as the immune response uh, goes on. And there's a loss of cilia. You won't see cilia in this area here along the uh, border of the of the uh, cells. Sometimes we measure the thickening of the trachea to um, assess how virulent uh, or whether we can pre prevent um, the uh, prevent the disease uh, with vaccination. So here we have air sacculitis in these in these uh, birds.
and the proximity of the ovary here to the uh, respiratory tract means that um, uh, ova can become infected with um, mycoplasma and then uh, get inside the egg as it passes down. Um, uh, normally, um, in in glass top eggs, this part of the oviduct actually becomes infected and it affects the cilia there as well. But um, um, so for glass top eggs, um, we often want to um, swab this area down here. But this can lead to vertical transmission of um, virulent mycoplasma and problems going from generation to generation. So respiratory pathology from mycoplasma, basically it's from the deciliation, the effect of the mycoplasma on the cilia and um, exudate accumula accumulation. And this is easier to see, well, we see it as air saculitis in chickens, but sinusitis is a very common problem in turkeys associated with mycoplasma infection. So this respiratory complex, mycoplasma aggravates or it underlies most respiratory complexes. Um, it causes CRD with the involvement of E. coli or other opportunistic um, uh, organisms. Um, it exacerbates Newcastle, infectious bronchitis, ILT, um, turkey rhinotracheitis virus or avian meta uh, pneumo, meta -pneumo uh, virus um, reactions, and uh, this can be vaccines or field strains here. Um, and this can cost the producer quite a lot. Uh, broiler in terms of FCR and mortality and lay layer in terms of production effects. So this leaves us with the question, how can we control this? We understand um, CRD and in fact the E. coli peritonitis um, a little bit deeper. Uh, usually what happens is that we have a respiratory insult, we have dust, um, uh, ammonia, respiratory viruses and respiratory vaccines can help to trigger off and the combination of these um, is aggravated the damage done by them is aggravated by MG and sometimes or MS. And finally, you get a super infection by opportunistic um, organisms. But the beauty about this model is that it says you can get benefits from um, attacking more than just the MG or the MS. Um, you can get benefits from improving the, the um, uh, sorry, improving the um, dust that, or the air in there. So vaccine reactions, especially to um, Lesota uh, in MG positive uh, chicks, uh, if you, if you um, have to uh, use um, Lesota uh, and then you give the birds um, you, uh, in MG positive cheeks, you often have to treat them with antibiotics at day 18 or else you'll have terrible reaction. Um, and in fact, uh, we have seen um, reactions even to uh, MG TS11 in breeders and layers where we've used Lesota and given um, the vaccine within uh, 10 days of, of the Lesota. Uh, one of the advantages if you've got um, uh, well, you can avoid this effect if you use less virulent uh, vaccines uh, like V4, which is totally viscerotrophic. Um, and in Egypt, they use it in MG positive chicks um, at day um, uh, at day 21 to boost them um, because Lesota is too um, strong there. Other ones are VGGA, um, which still have a little bit of respiratory effect and also ulster is, um, is viscerotrophic entirely. Um, if you got mycoplasma neg negative broilers, you can use stronger uh, ND vaccines and avoid um, vaccine reactions. 
Um, uh, so when doing when you're doing mycoplasma vaccination with Los, uh, Losota can be used, but not within 14 days of vaccination. And there's a difference here between F strain and um, and TS11. With the vertical transmission you get from F strain into broilers, sometimes um, it's it um, it will be aggravated by Losota. So the conclusion of the talk up to this point is that mycoplasma must be controlled. Uh, one way is suggested is freedom, and to do freedom you've got to kill positive flocks, or at least stream them. Uh, the problem with freedom is you've got a totally susceptible population. Uh, a very pragmatic approach to mycoplasma uh, but I think it's only should be used in the short term is antibiotics. We have problems here like acquired resistance. Uh, the need for us to do antibiotic stewardship and not pressure, uh, not use a lot of antibiotics in intensive farmed animals uh, because we could generate um, resistance profiles, not in mycoplasma, but in E. coli or other gut microbiota. And these could accumulate and get transferred uh, to human pathogens. Uh, also residues and costs are another uh, uh, thing against um, antibiotics. Killed vaccines were used in the 1970s and 80s uh, uh, and have some effect. They, they very good at making humoral antibody, but like I said, it's not clear that humoral antibody is beneficial all the time uh, and in fact can cause um, uh, some problems, maybe even interacting with um, live vaccines and decreasing the efficacy of them. And live vaccines are the current state of the art for people who can't run mycoplasma free and do this by uh, producing mucosal immunity. Uh, so people use combinations, but there are very there's very little um, uh, work that's been done on combinations, and people just think if you combine them, you're going to get more um, effect. But really, um, a lot of them are incompatible. You can't do freedom and antibiotics because you monitor freedom with serology, and antibiotics su suppress serology. And so you can think you're free, but you're not. You can't do antibiotics with live vaccines, as live vaccines are sensitive to all antimycoplasmal antibiotics, and um, live vaccines rely on the vaccine remaining in the trachea uh, to continue to stimulate immunity, a bit like trickle infection with coccidiosis. And there is very little work to show that killed vaccines and live vaccines can be done together. In fact, the only one I could find showed that they were incompatible. Antibiotic usage creates resistance. The more you use, the more you lose. Um, you can't effectively vaccinate broilers in modern systems with mycoplasma vaccines. The broiler's life is too short for a vaccine response, and it's not clear if the immune system is mature enough to give a useful response until 21 days of age. Uh, special systems with longer broiler life, may vaccination may have a, a place, like turkeys or um, turkey broilers, that is, uh, or yellow chickens or la belle rouge, those sorts of things. People do give killed vaccine, the day-old chicken is a bird getting uh, vaccinated. And um, this bird I used to say was one centimetre away from protection, but in reality, it's one centimetre and four or five weeks away from being protected because the bird has to respond to the vaccine. Um, here we have um, a video of bird being vaccinated. And the eye drop, which is 30 microliters, should fall through the air onto the eye of the bird. And when the bird blinks, some people mistake this as field chain, field strain um, 
infection and uh, we've shown by doing DIVA sampling on these flocks that there are no field strains up here in them. Um, so uh, serology is pretty useless for monitoring um, the vaccine. Here we have some data looking at the development of um, immunity after um, uh, vaccination with MSH and what we did is we took birds one week, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, five and six weeks after vaccination and challenged them with a virulent MS and we can see that we didn't actually get any protection from the uh, vaccine until um, uh, three weeks after and it didn't become maximal until five weeks after vaccination. Here we can see uh, a model of what we think happens is that the tracheal population increases rapidly and then the, um, the immunity starts to increase and that suppresses the tracheal population and eventually you end up in this steady state where the tracheal population stimulating and maintaining the um, regular stimulation to maintain it and it's not always parallel to the humoral antibody. Sometimes we see where birds are um, uh, 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 have um, where birds are um, uh, seronegative but still protected. So mycoplasma free broilers worldwide two programs have proved successful. Freedom in many parts of the world um, if you don't control MS, so you still might have problems. Um, and the other successful one is um, using an MG and an MS uh, live vaccines. And this has been um, uh, successful in many parts of the world. Uh, right. And I think that if antibiotics were the solution to mycoplasma, we would have cleaned up mycoplasma in 1950 and we still wouldn't be talking about it now. In layers, um, we put layers into cages years ago to stop faecal oral cycling of infectious agents um, uh, and or the invention of, um, of uh, coccidia stats also allowed intensification, more birds per, per square metre. But then respiratory disease and infections became more important. And in layers, you'll see this as snoring. <laughs> You know, and this is CRD, and you can sometimes monitor it by um, squeezing the uh, nostril and and seeing whether you can see exudate or or, um, or mucoid exudate in the to mucoparalent exudate after you, in the nares. So the reported responses to combined TS11 and MSH prevention of infectious synovitis and decrease PIP, air sacculitis and better quality day old chicks. This is a list of the um, studies that I could find where synergistic um, uh, effects with mycoplasma and other agents have been um, reported. And factors that seem to be in, important are uh, the pathogenicity of the vaccine virus, the um, reversion to virulence effects, especially with I, IB when you get um, um, a circulating IB, the timing of the infections, um, the age and type of bird, um, spray, how you do your spray vaccinations, uh, immunosuppression, ammonia, dust, Hatchery fumigation can be a problem if you overdose because this is cilia toxic. And so rolling reactions, that was the word I was looking for for IBV, uh, back passaging in, um, in birds uh, and so on are factors that we need to consider in the field when trying to control um, mycoplasma reactions, uh, respiratory reactions. So MG and MS free broilers are the FA cup of the chicken world. Um, if you've got vertical trans transmission of MG and or MS, you need to give it antibiotics around day 20 to 21 to prevent mortality and sometimes even earlier with the soda. Uh, horizontal transmission isn't that important in broilers. 
because very small amounts of um, uh, of mycoplasma get in, vertical transmission is so much more important. And once you get control of MG, you can stop your antibiotic programs. Uh, it's cheaper. You um, can uh, use stronger ND vaccines, maybe give you better ND protection. You avoid residues and it's more sustainable um, than, uh, especially with resistance that will develop in the, in the medium term. Uh, and this is just saying thank you for listening and don't air your chooks. Don't use F strain on your chickens. Thank you very much. Thanks, Chris, for this nice presentation. We are really privileged to have you with us. <clears throat> now, I will take you through a relevant solution, which is a liquid product from EW Nutrition used through drinking water, which can support during the respiratory distress. So as presented by Chris uh, about the mycoplasma problems in poultry, I will first take you through the customer needs or producer needs during the respiratory challenges. So the first customer need during the respiratory challenge is a quick relief from the respiratory distress. So as mentioned by Chris in his presentation, that the host response against the mycoplasma infection or against any respiratory pathogens, <clears throat> most of the times it's not in favor of host because <clears throat> it may generally result into heavy mucus secretions, which can create uh, respiratory distress, can be noted through respiratory rails and gurgling sound. And in poultry, the respiratory system is also uh, related with a, a thermoregulation system. So any respiratory distress also can cause the birds more prone to <clears throat> heat stress problems. Next is improvement in the appetite. Because any uh, challenge or uh, distress, uh, birds stop coming on feed and water. And if any medication is given during the respiratory challenge conditions, uh, if they are not coming on the feed and water, the medicated uh, feed or water is not reaching to them. And this is also important to have the energy uptake, which can help into faster recovery of the birds from the respiratory conditions. So improving the appetite is a second expectation. Third, reducing the need for antibiotics use. And this is mainly driven to the consumer <clears throat> because uh, nowadays, the chicken and egg consumers are looking for uh, options where the producers are supplying them the chicken products without antibiotic use or less possible antibiotics use. So given a choice, the poultry producers are looking for uh, solutions which can help them to reduce the need of antibiotics use even in the respiratory challenge conditions. Next is the reduction in the mortality. Because when you have a respiratory problem in the farm, you can always see the main mortality happens because of the suffocation. And that is, <clears throat> uh, that's why the birds, bigger the birds, they are more prone for suffocation and they can get hypoxic faster. And that's why whenever there is a respiratory problem, we can see the bigger the birds die first. Uh, you will never have the mortality in the small birds. And that creates a lot of impact on the feed conversion ratio and profitability of the poultry farms. So reduction in the mortality is also one of the most important expectations from the customer. So here is a solution from EW Nutrition, Gripozone. <clears throat> So gripozone is a phytomolecule based product, uh, which is a liquid additive uh, recommended to use through drinking water. <clears throat> so I will take you the through key benefits of gripozone. In the same line, we explained uh, with the expectation of the customer. So the first gripozone is coming with strong mucolytic activity, and which is one of the most concentrated product in its category. So gripozone, is bringing early and quick relief from symptoms during the respiratory problems, <clears throat> and which can be easily noted by reduction in the respiratory sounds within 24 hours of application of gripozone in the farm. Next 
benefit because of the anti stress and relaxant activity the ingredient of glucosone bring in it helps into reducing the stress and the birds start coming on the feed and water which helps into increasing the uptake of medicated feed and water or even energy which helps into speeding up the recovery of the birds from the respiratory problems Gripozone is also coming, uh, having uh, immunomodulating activity, which supports the immunity of the birds. So, especially in the viral pneumonia cases, gripozone helps into ensuring the immunity at the optimum level. So, it can help to avoid to get into super infections or secondary bacterial infections, and thus, gripozone can help to reduce the need of antibiotics. Next. As a consequence of decreased respiratory stress and improved health status, gripozone can help into reducing the mortality in the respiratory problems. So I will take you through some testimonials of gripozone use. So first, in layers. <clears throat> so as we all know, ILT, infectious laryngotracheitis, is a common viral disease vaccine used in layers. And it's a live vaccine and known to have a strong vaccine reaction. So in this trial, we did a trial in a commercial layer farm at the age of 10th week when ILT vaccine was injected. And in this, we had 50 birds, each group, five birds with five replicates. So 25 birds in each group. And one group was kept as a control and another group was supplemented with cryposone at 200 ml per thousand liter for five days. So results, we could see the gurgling sound with aculonasal secretions after ILT vaccine in control and gripozone group. After fifth, sixth, and seventh day post vaccination, gripozone was able to bring significant improvement uh, in the birds. <clears throat> we also studied the tracheal lesion scoring after ILT vaccine in the 21 bird sample size from each control and gripozone group. So the histopathology study showed that in control group, there was a higher tracheal lesion scoring and cilia and goblet cells were damaged. And we could also see high infiltration of inflammatory cells in respiratory epithelium. But in case of gripozone, we could see there was a lower tracheal lesion score and cilia goblet cells found to be more intact. We also seen the less infiltration of inflammatory cells. So with this uh, field study, we could show the benefit of gripozone because of its mucolytic and immunomodulating activity. Gripozone was able to elevate the ILT vaccine reaction in layers. <clears throat> Next testimonial is from broilers. And here we could show the benefit of gripozone in supporting in respiratory distress. So this trial was done in a commercial broiler farm with Ross 308 birds. Control and gripozone both group had 30,510 birds and gripozone group was supplemented gripozone through drinking water and spray. So gripozone was used at 200 ml per thousand liter for three days in 24 hours water from day 15 and day 24. So it is based on the vaccine schedule followed in the farm for ND and IB. Gripozone was uh, applied in two times starting from day 50 and day 24, each three days. So total six days of application through water. But because of some seasonality issues, this farm reported respiratory problems from end of fourth week. So gripozone was also used as a spray at 200 ml per 10 liter of water. That's a 2% solution. And this 10 liter was spread in 200 square meter area, which was started from day 29 to 31. But interestingly, as uh, reported by this farmer, uh, the respiratory problems caused increased mortality in the control group. So he was forced to use oxytocycline injectable form uh, from day 27 to 30. So results, we could see average body weight, mortality, HCR, EPF, all these performance parameter was were found to be significantly better than the control group. Especially on the feed conversion part, 
we could see six points improvement. And this was mainly coming, uh, as I mentioned in the, my first slide, that respiratory problems are always causing mortality in heavy birds. So by saving 3.2% mortality in gripozone group, it could bring almost six points improvement in the FCR, uh, which is also reflected by 32 points improvement in EPEF. So in conclusion, we could see that gripozone supplementation elevates the respiratory stress and during the critical periods, and it supported higher performance in broilers. So next is about application. So we recommend to use gripozone through water at 100 to 200 ml per thousand liter of water. So 100 ml is as a preventive dose. So based on uh, the experience from the previous batches or uh, to avoid the post-vaccine reactions or some, uh, some of the times we get a outbreak in nearby farms and we just want to start as a prevention, we recommend to use gripozone at 100 ml. But when the birds are already showing respiratory signs, we recommend to go for a double dose, that's 200 ml. The recommended duration is three to seven days based on the severity of problems in the farm. Gripozone can be also used as a spray or nebulization but it is restricted in some of the regions like EU and USA. But when it is allowed, uh, we recommend to use gripozone at 200 ml in 10 liter of water. That's a 2% solution. And this 10 liter can be spread in 200 square meter area. So we recommend to use uh, gripozone spray two to three days twice daily. So for more information of use of gripozone through spray, you can contact the local AW Nutrition Sales team. So this was my last slide. So if you have any questions uh, about the content of this webinar, please feel free to reach out uh, on the email uh, as it is mentioned on the webinar at awnutrition.com. And the all questions coming to this mail will be routed to us. We also, uh, uh, request you, you can also join for our next sessions. We have more webinars coming up in next few weeks. If you follow our website or LinkedIn channel, you can keep up and register. So thanks, thanks again for joining today and stay safe and bye for now. Thank you. <laughs>